Hello and welcome to this clip which compares cyclohexene, benzene and phenol. We're going to look at the reasons behind the differences in the reactivity between these three compounds and electrophiles. So to keep things simple we'll focus on the, the reaction with bromine and look at each one in turn. So we'll assume you've already looked at electrophilic substitution of bromine onto the benzene ring. Okay, so here's a diagram that I've used in my other clip um, when I'm introducing uh, electrophilic substitution. Um, this time, why don't you put down the two columns I've got, pause the clip and see if you can make some comparisons of your own, and then uh, resume the clip to see if we're in agreement. So what I've done here is I've highlighted or underlined uh, the important sort of language you need to be using when you're describing the two differences. So electrons are localised in the cyclohexene, but delocalised throughout the pi system in benzene. The localisation in cyclohexene leads to an area of an electron density that can easily induce a dipole, as you can see from the diagram, in the halogen. Uh, in benzene, this just doesn't happen, because delocalised electrons in the pi system are not electron dense enough. There's not enough of them in one place to induce a dipole easily. So therefore the cyclohexene halogenation proceeds by electrophilic addition, whereas the, uh, the benzene halogenation proceeds by electrophilic substitution. So let's follow up by having a quick look at the two different mechanisms um, that we need to think about. So if we look at these closely, one happens to have uh, chlorination, the other one happens to have bromination. So in the case of the addition, the electron dense carbon-carbon uh, double bond allows this whole thing to take place uh, and I've highlighted on the diagram when the Cl2 approaches the Cl, Cl bond becomes polar just like we talked about on the previous screen. So in the case of benzene as you know already a halogen carrier is required to create the electrophile, the Br+. Okay, so we've got two different uh, possibilities here both of them are dependent or sensitive to electron density so any comparisons we make in writing about the two mechanisms or the ease with which the, um, the bromination or chlorination, for example, takes place have to be based on electron density. So thinking about phenol, uh, phenol isn't one molecule on its own. It's basically any molecule that has an OH group directly attached to an aromatic ring. So the word phenol actually refers to a family of compounds that have this functional group within them. For example, salbutamol used in asthma inhalers, and this is considered a phenol because of this part of the molecule. And it's important to remember when something might look like a phenol, but it actually isn't. So for example, the one on the right hand side, 2-phenyl ethanol, isn't a phenol because the OH group is not um, directly bonded to the, uh, the aromatic ring. So you can see quite clearly why the two on the left are phenols and the one on the right isn't. So phenols are more reactive than benzene because there are eight electrons in the delocalized pi system instead of the usual six. What happens is the lone pair on the oxygen gets delocalized into the pi system, therefore increasing its electron density. So this means phenols are more able to induce a dipole in electrophiles, or attract them. So phenols are more reactive than benzene. So when we brominate a phenol, a halogen carrier isn't needed, and it takes place at room temperature easily. So you can see clearly that you get multiple brominations around the ring. So obviously you need sufficient moles of bromine needed to balance this. And obviously you have to have one HBr for every Br atom that's substituted. 
So because there's three in this case, that must mean you have three hydrogens that have been replaced, so therefore they have to go and react with something. Not forgetting, of course, that 3Br2 actually means six bromine atoms available. So if you use three of them up to substitute onto the benzene ring, you need to use the other three up when you're producing the HBr afterwards. So let's quickly recap by looking at what we need to talk about if you're asked to discuss this in a longer answer question. So the first thing to talk about is electron density like we mentioned earlier. So with cyclohexene, you have high electron density localized between two carbon atoms in carbon double bond carbon. For benzene, you have low electron density due to delocalization around the pi ring. With phenol, you don't actually have to say whether it's stronger than cyclohexene, weaker than cyclohexene, but you do need to say that it has greater electron density than benzene due to two electrons from the lone pair on the oxygen of the OH delocalized into the pi ring. And what this does in turn is increase the electron density. So what we're looking at in blue is the chemical consequences of the electron density. So in cyclohexene, this allows a dipole to be induced in or attraction of electrophiles. In benzene, it means uh, it doesn't induce dipoles or attract electrophiles easily. And in phenol, it induces dipoles or attracts electro electrophiles more easily than benzene. So finally, we can say how it's going to happen in pink. Halogen carrier not needed, happens at room temperature by electrophilic addition for cyclohexene. For benzene, a halogen carrier is required to create the electrophile, and it happens by electrophilic substitution this time as its mechanism. And for phenol, a halogen carrier not required, it happens at room temperature, but it still happens by electrophilic substitution as its mechanism. So the first thing you do is you comment on the electron density. Then you explain the ability to induce a dipole or attract an electrophile before outlining any conditions or reagents needed as a result of this. So the next thing to do is to have a look at an exam question that uh, tests out your ability to do this. So this particular question uh, talks about the reactions of benzene, phenol and cyclohexene with bromine. So um, the chemist in question uh, found that they all reacted with bromine but under different conditions. And she found that uh, when benzene reacts with bromine, a halogen carrier is required as a catalyst, so they want an equation for this reaction. Uh, it's only one mark, and it says you don't need to show the halogen carrier in your equation. So something along those lines will do the job. You can also use the, um, the displayed or skeletal formula if you wish. So either of these will be fine. And it says that the chemist found that when phenol or cyclohexene reacts with bromine, a halogen carrier isn't required. And she also looked at the fact that the bromine decolorizes when it reacts with phenol. Now, although it's not been covered in this clip, if you've been studying phenol reactions, you'll obviously know that the product that's made, which is your um, 246 tribromophenol, is also a white precipitate, it's a white solid. So although that particular part of the question is slightly outside the remit of this clip, um, it is one of the things that you need to remember. So if we move the page now down a little bit, we can draw out this product that we want. So notice that they want the organic product only. So you don't need the HBr, but obviously if you were writing out the full equation you'd include the second product as well like that. So then it says cyclohexene also decolorizes bromine. Be careful here to switch your thinking over to cyclohexene. We're not talking about phenol anymore. So if cyclohexene uh, decolorizes bromine, that means that two bromine atoms from Br2 will each substitute, or add across, I should say, beg your pardon, add across the carbon-carbon double bond. So that gives us 1,2-dibromyl cyclohexane. So as you can see, it's a five-mark allocation, and uh, it says you should use appropriate technical terms spelt correctly. In the 2015 onward specification, this would probably be a levelled question with a star next to it and be worth six marks. Okay, so let's have a think about the things we need to say. 
So I've split my answer into three sections to allow myself to think quite clearly about what part I'm going to talk about at each particular point while I'm answering this. So because it's five marks and the, the mark allocation to time sort of ratio is one mark to 1.3 minutes, you can safely uh, get away with spending seven minutes on this. So this allows you a little bit of thinking time, what I'm doing right now in other words, thinking about how I'm going to lay out my answer before we start moving on it. So in no particular order, it doesn't really matter which one you start with, I'm going to talk about cyclohexene first. It has high electron density due to localization of electrons across the carbon-carbon bond. This allows me to say that it reacts readily with bromine without the use of a halogen carrier. Notice I'm concentrating on cyclohexene to start with to avoid muddling myself up. So cyclohexene can induce a dipole uh, so it's reactive with Br2. So benzene has low electron density due to delocalized electrons. Phenol has higher electron density due to two electrons from the lone pair on oxygen. Which are, of course, delocalized into the pi system. In terms of the reactivity towards bromine, benzene requires a halogen carrier to create the electrophile, which is obviously Br+. Phenol doesn't require a halogen carrier and reacts easily with Br2. So finally, in my conclusion, I talk about how easily each thing can induce a dipole, how easily each compound can induce a, a dipole. So because it's to do with bromination, I'm making sure I'm speaking about the dipole in Br2. Uh, so what we've done is we've gone through each compound in turn and applied the three ideas, electron density, resulting reactivity, and a conclusion talking about dipoles um, to each of the compounds in turn as opposed to starting to write tons of sentences and risking getting muddled up. OK, so hopefully this was a fairly useful clip so far. Um, if you wish, we can have a quick look at the mark scheme. So I'll just pop that up now before we go. So without going through it in too much detail, if you wish, you can pause the clip and check through the kind of answers we've been talking about. But I would point out that what's actually allowed or disallowed in the additional guidance might vary from one year to the next. So try to focus, if you can, on the expected answers, because that's pretty much um, standard across all of, the, um, all of the mark schemes that we use. OK, so thanks again for your patience in listening, and uh, hopefully see you soon.